Welcome back to Fighting Misinformation Online 2022 Ideas Exchange. It's been a fantastic day so far, hasn't it? With so many learnings and insights, which I hope will help you in your respective work in tackling misinformation online. Well, I'm thrilled to say right now it is time for our final session of the day, an exclusive keynote speech with the author and journalist Peter Pomerantsev about how to beat the propagandist. Remember, keep your questions coming and a reminder to post your question and raise your hand on your device for a chance to ask your question live at the end of Peter's keynote speech. For the time being, please welcome Peter. <laughs> Now, I'm very aware of being the person who's standing between you and your PIVO, and I'm really sorry for having to take on the sort of role of the point of frustration. Um, it's also the first time I'm using these, these auto cues. I, I'm used to always just, I, used to, I usually just improvise my speeches between bullet points, but uh, this is going to be new. Um, I, hope, I hope I come over as really organic as I stare into these screens. Um, I'm sort of very privileged and very, very a little bit anxious about talking to this crowd because I know how, you know, how fiercely you interrogate all ideas and, and innovations. But um, that's kind of what I want to talk to you about today, um, which is sort of the, the sort of media innovations that, that I and some colleagues have started to experiment with in the face of a crisis which has sort of been the underlying theme of today's, uh, of today's discussions. Um, I think I have to go back a little bit to really understanding how, how I got here. And, and I suppose it's really about understanding the myths that I grew up with. And we all grew up with myths. Uh, myths which help give us meaning and construct our worlds and which are in invariably destroyed as we grow up. Um, for me, this was the myth about Man United would always win the Champions League or the Premier League. That's definitely been destroyed. Uh, but it could be the omnipotence of our parents, the premise of an ideology, the goodness of the country we live in, or, or maybe the presence of God, if we're going to get very, very deep about it. But as a journalist, uh, I grew up with a lot of myths myself. Uh, all my life, or my working life, I've either been making documentaries, or making entertainment shows, or writing long-form essays, or non-fiction books, or podcasts, or radio programs, all of it part of sort of some sort of way to understand reality and articulate it to a broad public. And, and I had all these myths that I sort of worked with all the time, which I had them sort of unthinking, and they're just ingrained in what I did. Um, but they described the purpose of my work, and, and they gave me lots of assumptions about the relationship of what I was doing to democracy, the relationship between media and democracy more generally. And we all know these myths. We, we, we talk about them all the time the marketplace of ideas. I mean, this concept and this sort of hurly-burly of democracy, somehow the best ideas will somehow rise to the top, that the most accurate information will win out uh, in, I don't know, through some theory of rational choice. I mean, that idea, given what we've been talking about today, seems almost like a medieval superstition. Um, when we see our discourse submerged under a deluge of disinformation, where people consistently choose to believe the lies that fit their biases, something that we've kept on coming back to today. Um, it just seems naive to think that some sort of theory of rational choice will lead people to seek out the best information. And we see that in the facts and the lack of facts about COVID through to who won the 2021 US election, evidence of war crimes in Ukraine. People will often choose the content that fits their biases their cultural identity. So rather than the best information rising to the top, people self-select their own reality. Or they just become so confused through the deluge of manufactured doubt and disinformation, they just give up on the possibility of finding the truth. We were just in a breakout session now and talking about Russian audiences, and even the ones who are skeptical about what the Kremlin tells them, they've just given up on ever finding the truth. Or we'll take another myth that I grew up with, or, or an assumption maybe. The assumption that pluralism automatically leads to better debate and better democracy. And that's something that I find very precious, as you can tell from my very non-English surname. My background is in, in the Soviet Union, in Soviet Ukraine, and I'm definitely not advocating for a return to like one state newspaper. Um, however, 
Um, the idea that just having lots and lots of media sources automatically leads to better exchange of views, a better debate, that again seems naive in an era of polarization that is so extreme, where different groups live in such different ecosystems, but also in such vicious identity groupings that they can't even, even admit the possibility that another side might have a case. So again, I'd like to repeat, this is not me advocating for less pluralism, but simply saying pluralism equals better debate and democracy, I think seems a little bit naive. And underneath all of this, you know, there's a notion of a democratic public sphere that entails the hope that we can all agree on the terms of a debate. Agree what is and isn't evidence, admit when the other side has won. If you look at all the sort of thinking and theory about the public sphere, which is not very well thought through, that's kind of the underlying set of premises that we have. But now we see, you know, this public sphere in democracies leading to political gridlock, stasis. I live in the US now, it's particularly prevalent there. And increasingly we hear dictatorships like China, like Russia saying, your system is inefficient. You guys can't have this mythical democratic debate. In order to compete in the 21st century, you've got to be a dictatorship. That's more focus, that gets stuff done. Your system, your checks and balances have just broken down into a mess of contradictions. And perhaps the most important myth that I grew up with in my working life, and the most romantic one, and probably the one that if I were to get drunk in a bar, I would like to sort of say, this is what I do. Holding the powerful to account with the truth. Yeah, to hold power accountable, to speak truth to power. But what happens when the powerful don't care about the truth? Yeah. We hold up evidence like garlic to a vampire, but they just laugh it off. We prove their corruption, their amorality, and it seems to mean nothing. Indeed, it's even worse than that, it strengthens them. Their supporters are so enthralled to them that our criticism only makes them stronger. I've heard spin doctors from Moscow to Mexico City tell me the same thing over and over. Their job as propagandists is no longer to build some sort of rational ideology, a set of political ideas that can be cross-checked and criticized with facts and information. Their job is to tap into people's resentments, their anxieties, their angers, package them into new community of common outrage, unite them around the leader who expresses all their humiliation, and seal the construct with hatred towards an enemy who you can project all your anger onto, whether that's the elites, the West, or, or us, the media. Now, we like to think, or I always like to think, that we serve the people, yeah? But there's a new, some would say old, but for me it's a fairly new brand of propagandists who have long made us into the enemies of the people. You know, throughout my work in Russia, the UK, Europe, the US, I found myself increasingly trapped in my own, I suppose I could call it a liberal bubble. Some of you are here. Um, inside that bubble, I can criticize power, but I talk to people who a priori agree with me. And the powerful are happy for me to rant and rage against them from inside this bubble. It allows them to point to their supporters and say, look how the liberal elites hate me and therefore you. So, Given this realization that has sort of dawned on me over the years, I've ended up asking myself, when I, fa when I fail to breach our bubble, when I work on projects that don't even try to engage with the broader public, am I actually not just failing to challenge the powerful, but am I weirdly helping them, reinforcing the political, social divides they create and capitalize on? There's that great Michelin Webb sketch when like, a couple of Nazis are sitting around and they go, one, at one point they look at each other's uniform and go, hold on, are we the baddies? And sometimes as I write things for the Atlantic maybe, I go, hold on, am I the baddie? So is there any way to break down the divides between them and us, constructed by the propagandists? Can the facts break through cynicism, confirmation bias and confusion? Can we create media that isn't just for our own tribe, but that it is public service in the sense of being for all the public? that helps actively build this elusive idea of a democratic public sphere. So since 2017, uh, I and some colleagues, first at the LSE and now at Johns Hopkins University, 
have been experimenting this. We call our little initiative ARENA. Um, very confusingly, we're now based at the Agora Institute at Johns Hopkins. So we're ARENA in Agora, which causes a lot of confusion. But, um, you know, putting the Latin and Greek traditions together. So much of our work is actually in this region, in Central Europe, in, in Ukraine, um, but also in Southern Europe and now in the US. Um, I'm going to go through a few examples of our work. Um, hopefully, they'll be relevant to the people in the room. There's a big Central Europe focus here, which is fantastic. And I'll break down some steps in our methodology. Uh, and look, this is a process of discovery. These are not iron laws to sort of like defeat the propagandists. These are just the questions we've been asking ourselves, which are open-ended questions. I should a priori say, I don't actually believe in like, here's 10 ways to kind of defeat Orban's propaganda. Um, it's not like that. It's more, how do we even start thinking about the subject? How do we start putting our editorial decisions into maybe a slightly different set of priorities? So I mentioned Viktor Orban for a reason. Um, one of the first things that we think about are the social categories and political identities created by the propagandists. They like to divide society into very simple binaries. Yeah? On one side, it's Putin's majority versus, this is the Kremlin's term, the liberasts. Or it's Trump's patriots versus the globalists, or any other version of the real people versus the elites that you care to reference. Look, these binaries are not accidental. And when you break down the numbers, they always favor the side who constructs them. So by repeating them, we risk reinforcing them. But how true are they? To what extent is society actually divided into these categories? So consider Hungary. Um, I think Viktor Orban is the master of dividing the country along cultural lines. Um, he's a hero now to many in the US. He's on, you know, there's, there's a whole you know, bit of the US right wing ecosystem which goes to Hungary, says that this is sort of the ideal culture war future that we want to see in America as well. And looking at Orban's recent electoral victories, he really does seem to be completely unbeatable in his mastery of contemporary media propaganda and how to divide and rule society. So he claims he's leading the Hungarian resistance to Islamification. He defends Christian values and Hungarian traditions against what Orban's loyal media often call Brusselites, stand in for globalists, for example. Look, and many of his arguments against minorities and refugees are deeply, deeply offensive. It's tempting to focus on rebutting them, which is a lot of very good media do that in Hungary, the ones who are still allowed to somehow survive. And of course, it's really important to do that. But to what extent is only focusing on such issues actually following the agenda and the framing that Orban wants? When we start our projects, we always begin with social research, with polling, segmentation, focus groups. We know people may well be divided on these sort of culture war issues, but to what extent are they defined by them? Are there other things they care about more that the likes of Orban want to distract people from by focusing on them? Are there common values, aspirations, anxieties they face? So in Hungary, we found that um, wherever people stood on culture war issues, they did not vote on them. So here's a slide. I don't know where to stand so you can all see the slide. I guess there's a slide for everyone. So look, Something like the rise in Islam in Europe, it's only 9% of people care enough to vote on that issue. Emigration is as much as an issue as immigration. So even immigration isn't this huge, all-dominant issue that Orban's state media and his own statements like to focus on. If you remember during the refugee crisis, he was constantly playing up this idea that Hungary was going to be the vanguard defending Europe from immigration. Most people can concerned with impoverishment, corruption, those sorts of issues. Um, so again, if you're thinking about the, the themes that you might be exploring, you know, getting onto those questions might be much more important to people than just focusing on the culture war issues that Orban likes to focus on. So only 22% of the population really buy into the Orban propaganda that Hungary is under assault from treacherous forces often led by nefarious international NGOs and liberal media. But outside this 22% bubble, there's not some cohesive group of globalist liberals. If you look at this sort of segmentation that we did, so we found that 22% is hard feeders at the bottom. Those are the ones who really buy into all the propaganda, propaganda narratives 
the government pushes. But the really sort of like, you know, the, the, the really sort of very, very liberal segment of society is the young liberals, largely in Budapest. That's only about 6% of society. In the middle, you don't have two strict bubbles. You have this very, very varied, rich, uh, and often contradictory society. There's sort of skeptical conservatives who are kind of conservative, sometimes vote with Fidesz or Jobbik, which is a right-wing party, but don't trust the government's rollback on democratic values. They're upset at Orban's increasing authoritarianism. Then there's a very large group of socialists and personally fascinated, huge block of 16% apolitical youth who are just kind of actually very, very skeptical of the government, but also feel very, very disempowered and very distant from any kind of, uh, any kind of serious political thoughts. So the majority of these groups are actually very, very worried about democratic rollback in Hungary, the decline in media freedoms, the assaults on the judiciary. Again, I know I'm going quite quickly through the slides, but you can see, you know, these are the classic democratic issues that people really, really, really care about. And all the way through society, really until you get to the hard Fidesz bloc, most people are really concerned about these issues. Now, take the skeptical conservatives, because we did a lot of focus groups with these people as well. So they were very skeptical of the way Orban was taking the country. They also thought that a lot of opposition media, what they termed opposition media, were politically over-engaged in their own way. Now, I don't want to validate that criticism, but it does mean that there is an audience gap there. There are people who feel that their concerns aren't being addressed, that their point of view isn't being addressed, and who can be talked to. So that's quite an interesting group there. So let's think about this. What does it mean to talk to people's anxiety? So there is different bits of society who feel they're not being listened to, their point of view isn't being taken into account. So we've often looked at this issue in other countries as well. So let's take the example of Ukraine. Um, we're very, very concerned there before the latest invasion by Russia that there was a growth in conspiratorial narratives. Now, these were very specific conspiratorial narratives. They were being pushed by pro-Russian TV channels. And they weren't pro-Russian as such. They weren't saying Putin is great. By that time, you really couldn't push the idea that Putin is wonderful in Ukraine anymore. They're actually targeted at something else. They were targeted at splitting Ukraine from the West, essentially. Yeah, basically pushing this idea that Russia might be bad, but the West is really evil as well. So narratives like Ukraine is under the covert external governance of Western curators, creditors, and Soros minions. Soros and the IMF want to exploit Ukrainian lads, lands, and one we've heard today quite a lot, the US has deployed a network of bio labs in Ukraine. So 40% believe some of these narratives, 25%. What was also very, very interesting was that a lot of these narratives were popular among people in the west of Ukraine. So people who are very, very pro-Ukrainian, very, very patriotic, but they seem to be experiencing something that made them open to these narratives. So our mission sort of building from the Hungary slides was how do we understand what is informing their worldviews? How do we understand them as an audience? And things got very interesting when we moved into focus groups with these people. We quickly found that people did have a suspicion that these conspiratorial propaganda lines were linked to Russian interests. They weren't duped. They kind of had a sense that probably Russia is involved in spreading them. But, and here was the most important thing, they found that this conspiratorial worldview resonated with their lived historical experiences. They'd been deceived, bullied, manipulated by the Soviet regime, by gangsters and oligarchs in the 90s, and this had left them feeling like they had no agency, that the world really was dominated by shadowy powers, that if there was Western aid give, being given to Ukraine, it was cheese in a mousetrap that they were encircled by enemies, that they were about to be betrayed. And these were the deeper anxieties, very much linked to a sense of disempowerment and a lack of agency that the propaganda played into. So when we wanted to think about how do we counter some of these issues, it was much less than about, sort of much less than simply debunking the disinformation. 
It really was about understanding those anxieties. Um, the problem is if you just debunk one set of conspiracies, another set of conspiracies will come along. And we see that over and over and over again, conspiracy communities emigrating from one topic onto the next, because it's the deeper conspiratorial mindset, which is actually the issue. So the sort of innovative media approaches that we thought would be able to help with this were all around types of innovation that make people feel more empowered. So we were very, very taken with some of Jeff Jarvis's ideas at NYU about engagement or social journalism. Yeah? The idea that you bring people into the newsroom to help to let them set the agenda. Or, or websites like Harkin, which pool ideas from the community, kind of an online town hall, which again lets people not just feel, but be more empowered in the search for more information. So this whole field of engagement journalism, sometimes working, sometimes known as social journalism, which is constantly inviting people into the process, not make them into civic, civil, civic journalists. We still have real journalists who do the work, but making them feel as if they're part of the process, that we're responding to them uh, and bringing that closeness together. Our theory was that that would help counter some of the deeper anxieties that allow the conspiratorial propaganda to spread. Russia then invaded Ukraine or reinvaded Ukraine. So even though we were about to launch those projects, we had to delay, but we might well bring them back. Uh, I do think this sort of propaganda will start reappearing again as Russia starts to split Ukraine from the West, as it starts to build on those divides. Ah, that's interesting. That's not the next slide. Ah, okay. I'll go back. Anyway, fine. We'll sit on that one for a second. We did, however, manage to test a whole bunch of approaches when we worked in Italy. Uh, we spent a year between 2017 working with Corriere della Sera, which is uh, the newspaper, the Italian newspaper of record, to experiment with different ways to cover the migration topic. Immigration, if you remember that part, point, was a huge subject in Italy. There's a time when you know, we'd had a year of refugees coming across the sea to Italy. It was a deeply polarizing topic, and it was capitalized on by one politician, especially Matteo Salvino, who was the leader of the anti-immigrant far-right Legia party, and he was Minister of Interior as we were doing our project. So what was very noticeable in that year, and again, coming back to this point of who's setting the agenda and what we're talking about, the amount of refugees was actually declining really rapidly at that point. Yeah, it was falling and falling and falling. There'd been a slightly dodgy deal done between the EU and Turkey. There were less refugees coming, dramatically less coming. The amount of stories was shooting up. Yeah? So less refugees, more stories. And this was all about Salvini raising the issue to the top of the agenda in very cynical, but very media savvy and intentionally self-scandalizing ways. So for example, I don't know if you recall, he stopped a ship with refugees from docking in Italy. That's completely illegal. You can't stop a ship of refugees docking. He did that on purpose in order to create and manage the, a huge debate around it. The most popular media at that time were stories about his own Facebook posts on this topic. And his aim was to split society into liberals and patriots. And if you were against his anti-immigrant policy, you weren't a patriot. So it was a highly polarizing issue. The language was very toxic. And we re we took hundreds and hundreds of articles that Corriera had written and analyzed the reactions to them on their Facebook site, all very much in line with GDPR. GDPR was coming in at the same time. Everything we did was very much in line with all those principles, which was hard for research, but correct for ethics. Um, and our aim was to see which editorial choices encourage a more civil debate, as in one with less you know, horrible language, with less abusive language, which encouraged trust to Corriere, so where there was less of people saying, I don't trust you, you're fake news, yeah? where there was a more kind of respectful attitude to the source and some other issues, but those are the two most interesting ones. So again, this is all about what editorial choices help a certain type of debate, which we felt was necessary at this particular time and in this kind of political situation. So some of the results were expected. The aggressive op-ed pieces inspired the most toxic and polarizing reactions. You know, you put a piece supporting Salvini or against Salvini and the, the, the reactions explode. We expected to see that. 
Others were a lot more surprising. So we found that infographics got high mistrust of media in the reactions. Yeah, so you put an infographic up there saying, here's the amount of refugees really coming in. It actually really split people. And I found that in other research I've done. My supposition, again, we'd have to follow this up with other research, was that people kind of pick and choose the data that suits them. Yeah, if the data suits what they think already, they'll say, yeah, I love this data point. If it doesn't, they go, oh, well, we don't know about the source of this. It's a bit dodgy. Multimedia things, as in like, an article, a photograph, a video, all together in one, seem to win a lot more trust. And again, I just have a theory on it. When people are confronted with lots and lots and lots of different types of evidence, they start to somehow be broken down. They're like, okay, there's this, this, and this. I'm starting to trust this source a bit more. Now, I should be very clear. Our research should not be treated as some sort of formula that can be replicated. There's not like five buttons that you push that work in every context. Every context is different. Everything is about the talent of the editor making decisions. All I'm talking about is here is a different intent, yeah? A way to factor in issues about what sort of debate we are fostering, how it impacts the public sphere. So it's a question of intent. Um, ultimately, what is it they were trying to achieve? More clicks powered by an ad tech system that encourages outrage and malign polarization, or a more productive debate? And a debate about what is a more productive debate. So I'll give one last example that we found which surprised me a lot. Whenever you have a tough emotional issue like migration, like refugees, my instinct as a journalist was always to do human interest stories. Let's tell the moving story of a person on a ship and in that way communicate to audiences who might not like refugees that we should be nice to them because look how much struggle they're going through. We need to have empathy for that struggle. So we actually found that such human interest stories could often be highly divisive and decreased trust. And I went out and talked to a lot of experts who focus on refugees and migration, whether they'd seen something similar, and they, they said that their research had kind of seen similar trends. And again, the theory that we have around this would have to be explored much more is that whether the refugees are good or malign, that doesn't actually change your sense that they're coming here. The sense of assault that some people felt didn't go away. You're actually just forced into a moral binary. Am I meant to like them or not like them? It's a moral debate you're having within yourself and maybe a lot of people push back against that. But again, it doesn't actually do anything to stop the framing that Salvini wanted. There's a lot of them and they're coming over here. The reaction, the type of articles that we found were the most calming, that gave the coolest reactions, the most amount of trust, were actually, and the BBC and AP people in the room will love this, really good, quite neutral background articles, sort of explainers. What are the roots of the refugee crisis? Where did it start? Why is it happening? And if you think about it, that makes sense, yeah? When a therapist gets patients to think about an issue, they try to get the patient to become less emotional. They put the problem in context, so as to be able to understand its roots and then focus on the solution. And if the migrant issue is at its roots, one about conflict in the Middle East or hunger in Africa, how can one start to tackle these deeper reasons? So I think the parallel with therapy is, is dodgy, but it's apt. The propagandists are constantly analyzing people's anxieties, feelings of disorientation, loss, and then manipulating them. There's a bunch of uh, polling going around among the academic community which is some of the insider polling that, that some Russian elites do uh, to understand their own populations historically. It's very interesting. Four questions on attitude. What do you think about this or that issue? Five, question, five pages of questions about emotion. Yeah? It's all about measuring resentment and emotion. That's all they are focused on. They're not trying to win a debate about information. They're trying to find out where the anger is, where the dismay is, where the anxiety is, and they're thinking about how to manipulate that. That's the game they're playing. And I think we almost have to, as we think about really tackling the propagandists, we have to start thinking about this space as well. I mean, they're a, bit of, they're a little bit like sort of cult leaders who are taking people's anxieties and fears and then manipulating them. We have to be the absolute opposite. Maybe we do have to take some lessons from therapy, taking these underlying issues, bringing them into public speech, bringing them into a place where we can debate them and talk about them coolly, passionately, whatever the situation really demands, but actually competing with them in that 
sense. That's not something that I started with when I started out in writing books or doing documentaries. I was very committed to just getting the facts out there. But increasingly, I realized that if we really do want to challenge the propagandists, it's the sort of challenge that we have to face. I have people waving at me that I should finish now, so I shall. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Pomerento, thank you so much. And the people waving, honestly, it's purely because there are so many questions coming in. And that kind of concept that you were talking about, the individual story that we really focused on as journalists, actually it's the explainer, the bigger picture thing that people really need to hear. So thank you for sharing that. Right, questions coming in. We have a question coming in from table nine, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, Richard Jingris uh, from Google. Uh, that's very good, thought-provoking presentation. Really appreciate it. Um, I would say I, over the last half a dozen years, have come increasingly and totally convinced that we are intrinsically, purely tribal beings, that the very notion of rational thought and behavior is an artificial construct that we simply apply to our own tribal beliefs. Now, taking that forward to your thinking here, your analysis of Hungary, which I think really resonates with me, that we easily fall prey to a propagandist issues that are not really the issues, as you point out. Um, I certainly see that in my own country, where I feel like the left, the progressive left, is just consistently falling into traps set by those who are very sophisticated at setting traps regarding fear and so on and so forth. And it's compelling and you want to rise above that, but it seems to rise above that, that means that my issue tribe, be that immigration or gun control or whatever, has to suppress its objectives to their larger tribe of say, my open society tribe or my liberal democracy tribe, which is kind of a complex step to take, is, is sound strategically as that might be. Peter. I think yeah, there might no, no, be a I think, question I think in there's, there. It's, it's a very good point. Um, oh, I, I, there's two elements to that which I think are fascinating. So one of them is the use of the word identity, which is used all the time, you know, and, and how everything is about identity. And, and that's what I've had propagandists tell me. They don't mean identity politics in the American sense. They mean about building identities, constructing new ideas of the people in order to give people a place, a tribe to belong inside. I suppose their theory is we live in a time of flux. Yeah, in a time of flux, people feel disorientated. The flux is because of economics, technology. We know many of the reasons. And in that flux, what people need is a community to gather around to. And your job in politics is now to give them that. And you give them that by giving them someone to love and someone to hate. Um, at one point, and I hear this word identity all the time, and at one point I went and actually asked the psychotherapist, like, like, how do you think about identity? And again, this is one take, I think every psychotherapist would have a different one, but he was basically like, I have a huge problem with that word. Because identity, when people are growing up, can often be very, very aggressive. Yeah, you're a small child, you can't deal with the big world, it's too confusing, uh, and so you create this very, very aggressive identity, which at its extremes in a child is actually very, conspiratorial. There's like good mummy who feeds me and this weird evil mummy who doesn't. And you divide the world into black and white. And his job as a therapist is to get people to create a different type of identity. We all need to have identities. There's, there's, you know, we all need to have an eye and a community, but it's about what type of identity. Is it aggressive and paranoid? Or is it one that's open-ended and you realize you're made out of different things and mummy can sometimes go into the kitchen? So it's not getting rid of identity. It's not getting rid of tribes or whatever but it's a different model for it. So I don't think it should be identity tribe versus rational. It's about being open-ended. We spend a lot of our time thinking about what is the public sphere? What is democratic discourse? You know, which is something that, again, we should take for granted, but what does it actually mean? And the kind of underlying principles that we found, and this is just through many conversations with other people who think about this, is it's actually three things. One of them is having enough empathy and open-mindedness to admit that the other person has a point. And I'm not saying hug a fascist. If those people say that other people don't have rights, they're not in the conversation. You know? That old democratic paradox can be cured very easily. 
Uh, the second one is agreeing on what evidence is. Not on the facts themselves, but what constitutes evidence. And, and the third one is the discussion has to lead somewhere. It's going to lead to political change. Now, all three of those are very, very hard. The first one is the hardest one. And I think there it is about media, it's also about culture, it's about movies, it's about TV shows, but it's also about little things like debate formats. So I'm trying to bring this back to what we do. It's very funny because my background originally is in reality shows and entertainment is to watch the US debate shows before the election, the, the Democratic primaries, where every, the way they're devised is how we did reality shows. They're there to engineer low-lying personality conflict. So the way they're designed is, in case you didn't know, if you say something, and the whole point is to get oxygen, to get attention, the best way to get more attention is to attack someone. Because then they have a right of reply, they'll attack you, it'll go back to you. And that's how you get Pete Buttigieg and Amy Klobuchar just having this kind of like awful like, you're ugly, no, you're ugly, no, you're ugly debate, because they know those rules. So the way it's been set up a priori is to feed against any kind of productive discussion. So, I don't know, we could do those debates differently. Give them a common issue to face, show how they're going to work with each other to deal with it, and show how they're going to work with the other side to achieve it. You've tweaked the format, and already it's a different conversation. I could go on and on, and Cash is giving me that look. Yeah. But so what I mean is, yes, we are, but that's not a cause for despair. There's lots of different types of tribalism, lots of different types of identity, and, and as journalists, we have a responsibility. Reality shows, that's, yeah. That's, yeah, we devised political <laughs> debate like reality shows and were surprised when a guy from reality shows won it. I mean. Enough said, enough said, absolutely. Well, we'll give you a gloss over that. Um, lots of questions coming in, that's why I'm giving you that look. Jennifer Brandel joins us from our virtual audience. Jennifer, over to you. Where do we look for the virtual audience up in the sky? Where? Oh, there she is. Oh, right. OK. We've, we can see you. We're just going to unmute you, Jennifer. So the moment we unmute you, come on, we've got you. To, hey, we've got you now. Go for it, Jennifer. Oh, no, you're still muted. When you unmute yourself, we will ask you a question. Oh, rather, actually, you're going to be asking Peter a question. We just need to get that unmute button working. Have we got it? Go for it, Jennifer. We can see you. All right. Now I can unmute myself. Go, Thank you for the powers. <laughs> Excellent. Um, Thank you. It was really lovely to log on right as Peter was talking about engagement journalism and that really being a key to depolarizing, inviting people in, rehumanizing them, et cetera. I'm curious for Peter, um, I'm really struck by the, the struggle that companies like mine and others have had in making this large scale change quickly enough to counter the tide of the other trends that are happening. And I wonder in your mind, will it take a DARPA like investment? to help newsrooms really rewire to become more democratic themselves and to start to listen and respond to the public in a way that they need to uh, for us to have any fighting chance of winning. Because I, I find, I'm finding the incremental approach of us trying to work newsroom by newsroom is insane and maybe won't work in time. So curious to know your thoughts. I'm so glad you asked that question. Um, so what, what organization are you in? Sorry, I don't, I don't, just so I know. Oh, you're Harkin. Okay, go on. All right. Well, I mentioned you guys just now. Um, so we had this great plan to work with Harkin, uh, and then the war started. Um, so let's look at this historically. So look, we have been here before, and it often happens when a new media intervenes into society. So you can almost parallel what happened with radio to what's happened with the internet. First, there's incredible enthusiasm uh, about the promise of radio connecting people across borders, connecting everyone. Uh, incredible if you read the sort of, the, the, sort of the, the writing from the 1920s that thought radio would end all wars because people would be able to hear each other and would never fight again. That was the optimism at the start, uh, very comparable to sort of the enthusiasm around social media. Then Hitler and Stalin kind of go, oh, hold on, we can use this for something very different um, and unleash the demons of their totalitarian propaganda. And then it takes democracies, and I'm simplifying the story for the sake of storytelling, because I'm a journalist. Um, but, um, and then the democracies start to respond. But the interventions are huge. The interventions is the creation or 
the ramping up of the BBC to this idea of being the sort of the carrier of the public sphere in Britain. And if you read Lord Reith's autobiography, then you will find that's the founder of the BBC. That's exactly how he's talking about it. He sees the BBC as bringing society together and rebuilding the city state of old. He's referencing Athens, I think. Um, in America, you've got Roosevelt. You've got, you know, you've got this very, very different approach to radio with the fireside chats, which shows that you can use radio in a way that does inform and gather people in, doesn't have to just be used for, for hate and lies. But like, you know, the BBC especially is a massive, massive, massive intervention and grows into a really big one. Um, we'll need stuff like that. So again, in Europe, I think it's easier for us. We just have to move from like public service broadcasting to public service tech design, civic tech, you know, the support through various types of, I think, tax innovation for the sort of media that I've been talking about, whose job is to sort of engage different publics. But at least we have a tradition for it. When I say the words, public service in America, all doors shut in my face. So in America, I call it Tocquevillian media. I just gave away my little secret. I forgot this is broadcast. I call it De Tocqueville was a philosopher that Americans love, both on the left and the right. He's all about civic media and bringing society together and civil society. I expect in America, it is gonna be, but huge support to lots and lots of bottom-up initiatives. But it is about incentive. I mean, when I talk to journalists, they get what I'm talking about. What they say is, look, if we want to survive, usually in an ad tech environment, which encourages polarization, we just can't do this. So it is going to be about big, big, big interventions. Um, who's going to be behind them? I'm not yet wise enough to the US to understand. I'm very encouraged by some of the legislation around helping local news. That might be a way forward. But civic media and Tocquevillian media is the language that I've found at least gets me an audience. So yeah, um, it's going to be easier in Europe. It really is, because we do have a tradition of it. I, but, hope, um, yeah. I hope that answers your question. What a fantastic. You're not meant to give away your sources or your intel, but there you go. Peter, absolutely fascinating. We could listen to you for the rest of the day, but we are, as always, out of time when it comes to broadcast television. Peter Pomerensev, everybody, thank you so much. Thank you. Now, we are going to welcome back Tanya Lemoyne from Google because we've just had such a fantastic day. So many different thoughts, such a, a lot to take away and digest. Tanya, when it comes to what you're taking away from today, what are the points that you're going to take home with you tonight? Yeah, thank you. So, Peter, this was fascinating. Uh, thank you very much again. Um, listen, we promised you uh, hopefully new, new and good ideas, um, best practices, what works, what doesn't, and new connections. So I think if I would summarize it, I hope we have delivered on all three of these. If you allow me, I would like to maybe mention and remind us what were those ideas that were striking for me or really interesting. I, I was very grateful to listen to uh, Valerie on the filter project and uh, idea of Media Literacy Club. Uh, there were some keywords, you know, I come from Google, so keywords, that's our job. So some of those keywords, co-creativity, engaging young generations, uh, cross generations, a lot of talks as well about senior people, micro influencers, uh, lo a role of local community and local media in, in what we're doing here. So I think these were some of the fascinating new ideas that we heard. Uh, then there was one specific topic delivered by Beth, and thank you very much again, great workshop on pre-banking. Um, maybe many of us or some of us uh, listened uh, or learned about pre-banking for the first time. I actually Googled it, I learned the definition, it's a process of debunking lies, tactics and sources before they strike. And I realized I spent first 22 years of my life doing just that. Uh, so I come from that generation that never took uh, uh, where we, democracy and where we live now for granted. So thank you very much. And third one is connections and collaboration. I really find it extremely important for us to meet from the worlds of media, with the world of technology, with the world of NGOs and academia, uh, because and governments, obviously, because 
as I said during my speech, it is not, this is not a challenge uh, one party can tackle alone. So this was like super useful. Absolutely. It's been such a rich, content-full day, hasn't it? There's so much to take in and digest. Uh, ultimately, the title of today has been Fighting Misinformation Online. And I guess, Tanya, what we'd really like to know is what Google's role is in the battle in fighting misinformation. Yes. So Google, as a tech company, obviously has a role to play here. We love to be very active partner, and I hope you see the event today is, is just example of that. Uh, I shared with you as well that the first event took place last year. This is the second one, and we will continue. So this is a series of long-term effort and initiatives, which I believe we're going to be very actively involved with, with partners. You heard about the European University Institute, uh, Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation. Uh, you will as well uh, hear later on more about more local partners as well coming from this region because again we cannot do it alone we need to do that together we would love to serve as as today as contributor to a platform where people meet and can discuss ideas so partnerships and platform uh, all this includes supporting research supporting and enforcing new policies that will be necessary supporting industry efforts. So all that together with many partners. We as well will, as we already are, making important product adjustments because after all we are a tech company. So we need to make adjustments following the evolution of the situation uh, so that our products actually are supporting the trend. And last but not least, we making financial contributions. So I would like to mention last year's um, uh, contribution to European Media and Information Fund, uh, which, is, which has been a contribution of 25 million euro going to projects supporting new thinking on media literacy initiatives, fact checking, but as well academic research. And uh, this year you could uh, hear from our CEO Sundar Pichai who came to Warsaw a few months ago announcing additional $10 million support specifically for this region because we've heard and it resonated so strongly why Central and Eastern Europe is such an important region as the experience here with this challenge has been, uh, has been very, uh, very strong. So 10 million uh, additional euro coming to support partnerships and working with organizations in in this region. So a lot going on, an yes. awful lot going on. In yes. terms of like further down the line, what's next, Tanya? So in terms of what's next, um, as I mentioned, this is not the beginning. The beginning was last year of, in October, but this is continuation of a long-term effort. So I would love that we all leave here today with hopefully one or two new ideas, ideally, few good new connections. The best thing is from those industries that you are not uh, predominantly from, because we need to work on this together. And then the next event takes place in November. It's going to be in Brussels. And what we as well hoping to achieve is to go from big picture strategic conversation, which is the one which took place last year in October, to today's which is much more practical, discussions, ideas, exchange, etc. going again back to strategic in November in Brussels. And all that, of course, in collaboration with many of you here and with our partners, and as well with the big and big crowd that has been joining us online for the whole day. So this is, this is in the plan. A lot to look forward to, a big exchange of ideas. Everybody, Tanya Lemoyne from Google, thank you so thank much. You. My goodness, we have heard so much. I hope you've really enjoyed today. It's not been just incredibly informative, it's also been hugely thought-provoking. So I want to thank all of our amazing guest speakers, and of course to you, our audience. You have been engaging so enthusiastically throughout this whole event. And also to our virtual friends, I hope it's been a really great experience for you, and to our friends here in Prague. I wish you all safe travels on your journeys on. Remember, exchange those ideas 
and let's get the conversation going. From all of us here, thank you very much. Goodbye.